scripture readings today is John 16, 17 through 14. <clears throat> but I tell you the truth, it is for your benefit that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict, convict the world in regards to sin and righteousness and judgment in regards to sin. Because they do not believe in me in regards to righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. In the regard to judgment, because the prince of this world has been condemned, still have much to tell you, but you cannot yet bear to hear it. However, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears, and he will declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me by talking, <coughs> taking from what is mine and disclosing it to you. So be it. start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come and worship you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we have so many copies of it, so many ways to read it, Lord. May we hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against you. May your spirit reveal your words to us so that we will know the truth, that we can share the truth. And Lord, help us to realize the power that we have, the job that we have before us to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ and that you've brought us together as a family, the family of God, children not born of flesh and blood but born of the Spirit. We thank you and praise you for all the wonderful things that you're doing, that you're reconciling man to you through Jesus Christ and through the power of the Spirit. Thank you for this day that we can come and celebrate the freedom that we have in this country and, and celebrate the God who loves beyond all measure in comparison. Fill this place with your spirit, Lord, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week was Pentecost, and we talked about the Spirit coming in power to the church. And I want to talk a little bit more about that, about the why factor and the power that's there. And I entitled this, Jesus is going, or He's gone, and the Spirit is coming, or He's here. I don't know about you, but we live in a world that wants to just get everything just like that. I mean, even when you go to the gas station to fill up your car because you can't go anywhere if you don't have gas, right? You look for a pump that doesn't have people at it. Nom Nom is the cheapest place in town usually posted, but there's usually more people there. And many times I'll drive by and say, well, I'll get gas later. Or I'll pay more because I don't want to wait in that. I want that instantaneous. And can you imagine if it took the pump 15 minutes to fill your tank? Oh, who wants to wait that long, right? Have you ever seen that little thing downtown that's got green paint around it? You know what that is? That's a charging station for an electric car. Yeah. What if we had to charge all the time to do something, and we had to charge, and it took a lot of time to charge us? How much time are you spending reading God's Word? How much time are you preparing your hearts to meet the Lord your God? How much time are you spending in prayer? You know, for years and years, there were so many prophecies and the people had such hope of the Messiah coming. But then the children of God, even with the mighty miracles that Jesus performed, missed the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. Wow. You know, it's my prayer that the church doesn't miss the power of the Holy Spirit. Because, you know, we can't go very far on empty tanks, can we? The power of the Holy Spirit came upon those at Pentecost with the sound of something that sounded like a tornado. I don't know if any of you have ever been in that or not, but that is the most eeriest sound in the world. And the sight that was there as a result 
was not destruction from wind or anything, but it was the fact that it looked like tongues of flame were descending and landing upon each. Just like the Spirit of God descended as a dove from he heaven and came to Jesus. The Holy Spirit that was promised by God came upon His people. Now I'm going to go back and say this again. For years and years and years, the Messiah was promised, the one that would, could, that would heal the lame, uh, give sight to the blind, bring, set the captives free, set up the kingdom ministry, and, Jesus, and God's children missed the fact. The Holy Spirit was promised by God to be given to God's people again so that they would know that they are God's children, that they would be sealed, and that they would have power to live holy lives and draw others into the kingdom. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you for that very reason. I could stop right there and we could ponder on that. Are you tapped into that energy? Are you tapped into that power? Are you tapped into that person? We talked about that a little bit last week. God lives with you. It's not just some power. It is God Himself, the triune God, living inside of you. No one can separate you from God's love because you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You are also empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a holy life that the children of God never did before, but now you have the power. At Pentecost, after 10 days of prayer and waiting, being, uh, having unity of mind together, the believers witnessed in power the Holy Spirit coming upon them, and they began speaking in tongues of all the different languages, telling the fact that God loves them and that salvation comes through Jesus Christ and no other. Merle read in John 16 today, it says, but I tell you the truth, that's a if you read into that, prior to that, that's opposed to the fact that you're going to suffer for my name. You're going to suffer for me, but you're also going to be glorified. So Jesus says, I tell you the truth, or verily, verily, it is for your benefit that I am going away. Do you think about the Holy Spirit that way? It is better for you, it is for your benefit, what can you gain from it that, the, that Jesus has left this earth physically so that you can be empowered by the Holy Spirit? It's not just to seal you, it's so that you can do something, that you can live a life a certain way. And what did Jesus teach that we are to do? But to be a light to this world, to love our enemies to turn the other cheek, to think of others more than we think of ourselves, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, and to love others, our neighbors, as ourselves. And we have the power to do that. That's why it's for your benefit that Jesus is going away. Because unless He goes away, the advocate or the comforter, the paraclete, the one that comes, it is called to someone's aid. Jesus was calling the Holy Spirit to your aid something that God had promised for years that would happen, just as the Messiah was promised, but the Holy Spirit was promised from Scripture also. Unless Jesus went away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if Jesus goes away, if I go away, I will send Him to you. Verse 8, And when He comes to you, He will convict. The word means reprove, that change of mind so that it can change your heart, so that it changes the way that you live the way that you act about things, so that you realize that you've got to go and plug yourself into that station down there. You've got to plug yourself into this word. word, word. Sorry, I'm tongue-tied today. That the power for you to do the things that you can do for God come from God Himself. As God is making His plea to the world through you, and the power for you to do it comes from God, it's God Himself. He is the one that justifies you. He is the one that sanctifies you. He is the one that will come back and claim you for His very own. He will convict in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Have you ever thought about that? He will change your thought to sin. Because, uh, in regard to sin because they do not believe in me. 
What's the one unpardonable sin? That when the Holy Ghost comes to you and convicts you that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, you say, no, there's other ways. No, I'm not ready today. Whatever it might be. We are all sinners and we need a Savior. God with us, Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In regard to righteousness, God's holy standard, because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. Well, what does that mean? That means that that holy standard is still there. You are God's children called to live a holy, righteous life so that others will see God living in you. That we have to purge the sin from our, from our lives, from, from our thought process, from what we do. And the power of God living inside of us in the form of the Holy Spirit, we'll do that as we let Him do that, as He sanctifies us through and through. In regard to judgment, because <laughs> I am forgiven, I am pardoned because of Jesus Christ, because the prince of this world has been condemned. Satan has no power over you. Death has no sting for you. And Satan, you can't say the devil made me do it. <laughs> that doesn't work. The devil can't make you do it, and God living in you can have you do anything and everything that is in His will and His power and His might to bring glory and honor to Him. Think about all those hero and heroines of the Old Testament and how they would long for what we have today. Now, do they see us using that power? Think about that. Everything that they dreamed of, Jesus Christ came in the flesh lived and died for us, taught us and expounded upon the truth of God's Word. And then the Holy Spirit, He said, I'm going to go away so the Holy Spirit will come. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to be that kind of people, God's chosen holy people. Are we living that way? Verse 12, I still have much to tell you, but you cannot yet bear to hear it. However, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own, but He will speak what He hears, and He will declare to you what is to come. He will glorify Me by taking from Me what is Mine and disclosing it to you. You have the gift of prophecy, believe it or not, if you have the Holy Spirit. Because you have the gift to understand God's Word as you ask Him to reveal it to you so that you will use it. I've said this before and I'll say it again. It's just like my child coming to me and saying, teach me this, Dad. And he's not interested. I'm not teaching him. He comes to me next time but seems like he's a little more interested but has his phone in his hand, not paying me much attention. But he's really interested in learning what this, this subject is that he comes to me about. I'm still not interested in teaching him. But when he comes to me and says, I want to learn, Dad then that's when I'm going to teach him, and that's when he's going to be willing to understand and, and take in what I'm teaching him. And that started with, but I tell you the truth, it is for your benefit. Even though you're going to suffer for the kingdom, you know you're going to be my witnesses and everything else. You know that it's going to cost you your life. Don't be surprised if people hate you and despise you because of me. But I tell you the truth, it is for your benefit that I go away because the Holy Spirit will empower you to do that job. Do you see the truth of this scripture? Jesus lives in and through you. He suffered and died, and then he went to glory. And he calls you to do the same. Jesus is the ruling King of kings and Lord of lords. And you have a place beside of him. You have the authority, all authority in heaven and earth was given to Jesus. And he said, go therefore and be my disciples. And now they have the power to go and do that job. And remember, they waited 10 days first and prepared their minds and their hearts. They spent time together with one another with one mind and one prayer, praying to receive the promise that God had, had told them that they would receive. So now I'm going to go back to Acts and remind you what's written in the first few verses. In Acts chapter 1, in my first book, O Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. This beginning of ministry. What Jesus did and what Jesus taught. Word and action. Okay? Until the day that He was taken up to heaven, which He said, it's better for me to go 
so that the Comforter will come for you so that you can continue to do what Jesus did. Did the things that he did. Think about that. And to talk about and teach the things that he taught. So that you not only teach your children, but you have the power to do the things that Jesus did while he was here. <clears throat> Until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them with many convincing proofs that he was alive. After your suffering on this earth, you will spend an eternity alive with God in heaven. He appeared to them over a span of 40 days and spoke to them of things about the kingdom of God, more expounding upon what the kingdom looks like. And we started with that weeks ago with the fact that a kingdom has a king and you pledge your allegiance to the king. Everything that you have is because the king gave it to you, even your life, and you owe your allegiance to him or you pledge your allegiance to another king. Verse 4, And while they were gathered together, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that the Father has promised, which you have heard me discuss. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. A full immersion, covering, head to toe, by the Holy Spirit, the person of God, the power of God, that hovered over the darkness that walked with Jesus in his ministry, that rose Jesus from the dead. That power you will be totally immersed with. Verse 6, So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? We still have our eyes fixed on earthly things rather than on spiritual things. This is not about the kingdom of Israel. It's about the kingdom of heaven coming to earth. Jesus replied, It's not for you to know the times or season that the Father has fixed by His own authority, but you have authority and you will receive power, verse 8. See, the authority is mentioned in verse 7. You already have the authority and now you will receive the power. You will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the utter, utter ends of the earth. After he had said this, they watched as he was taken up, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. You know, some people think that each and every one of us has their own guardian angel. That might be true, that might not. But guardian or angels are messengers from God, and they are here in times of trouble. We see it all throughout. And here they're in bewilderment, don't know what to do, and they bring a message. Go do it. Remember what Jesus said? He said, I am going to prepare a place for you and I'm coming back. Now go do what he told you to do till he comes back. Oh, yeah. See the message? And they're there to protect us and watch over us, yes. They stood beside them. They have the same mission. They're of one accord to serve the Lord their God and to bring about his purpose. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Don't you have something to do? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. And that's when they started their ministry, right? No. That's when they went back together and studied God's word and prayed, up, upheld each other, comforted each other, all the things that they could do in the flesh until the Spirit came and they could worship the Lord in spirit and in truth with power, united together, one accord. Pray to do what? What do you think they prayed for? To receive that promised power so that their hearts wouldn't be troubled, so that they wouldn't be afraid, but instead realize the benefit that was given to them so that they could see the spiritual truths, the spiritual wars that we face instead of just the physical that Jesus was gone from their eyes. So I'm going to go to John 20 now. We know what that story is about. It's the story of resurrection. And I want to remind you that there's not just 11 disciples <coughs> There are the women that follow Jesus in His ministry. If you read on in Acts, there's 120 that are gathered together. 
I don't know how the church can teach today that the Holy Spirit came upon the 11 or 12 disciples in power and that was for that season and now that power is not there. I told you I don't believe that. I believe we're missing out on the power. We don't plug ourselves in. We don't understand that. We don't pray for that. We're not in one accord and we're not seeing the mighty miracles that we should see that God intends to have His church. That power came upon 120 men and women. And what did they do? They spoke in different languages so that the world would know who God was and His love for them. John 20, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, she said, and we do not know where they have put Him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out for the tomb. The two were running together. They had urgency to see Jesus because their hopes were in Jesus, that He was the Messiah. But the Jewish nation as a whole missed this fact. And remember, God has promised His Holy Spirit also, and it is better for you that Jesus goes away, that His Spirit comes to you. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked at the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter arrived just after him. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying, to, lying there. Now, I'm going to expound upon some of this in my own. you got one disciple who loves following the Lord and everything, but he comes and... Let's make sure I get this right and I don't say it backwards. Yes, he looked in, but then you got Peter that came along. and <laughs> He went in, right? You know, all this time John's beside him. John's even at the crucifixion and everything else, but he's afraid to go in. We need each other. We need each other to, to help each other along the way because one was afraid to go in. I don't know. The Scripture doesn't say that. Let me clarify that. But he didn't go in. And the other one, based on what my interpretation is in, in, in putting a... a personality to them. He barges right in. So it's good that I've got you to go along with me to this place and that place and the Spirit will give you gifts that He doesn't give me all so that we can tell each other and tell the world that Jesus Christ is alive. That God sent His only Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. And don't forget there's a woman there already. Okay? And what her involvement is. Um, verse 5, he bent down, looked at the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Verse 6, Simon Peter arrived just after him. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head was rolled up, lying separate from the linen cloths. Now, let me think about that. So from the door, John couldn't see anything but the body wrap. But Peter, because he barged on in, got to see the head cloth. And the head cloth is folded up nice and neat separate from it. Well, now you do a little thinking and a little studying of God's Word and reading some other things. And what was common at that time, and at the great banquet, when we're meeting and eating and, and, and celebrating, if the host of the banquet got up, he would fold up his towel, letting the servants know that he was coming back. Was that what Jesus was telling Peter? That he was coming back? His job wasn't finished. His ministry wasn't finished. That it was for them to carry on his ministry until he returned. Not just that he's alive, that he's gone, but that he folded up that head towel and said, I am your master and Lord. Go about my bidding and I will be back. Oh, I could go into so many different parables and things here, but I'm going to keep going. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in because Peter went in. Would he have gone in if Peter didn't go in? I don't know. Like I said, I'm putting a lot of variables there to it. And he saw and believed. Would John not have believed if Peter hadn't went with him and Peter gone in? Do you see why we need each other? you see why we are part of the family of God? One is an arm, one is a leg, one is... I don't know what's bothering me. Sherry thinks it might be appendix. <laughs> but I know something. I want it to work right <laughs> so that the rest of the body functions properly. 
I need you in the body of Christ. You need me in the body of Christ. We need you. We need each other. And we all have the power of God's Spirit living inside of us to carry out His work, this thing that we call the church. He saw and believed, verse 9, for they still did not understand from the Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she bent down to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white. We get two angels in the story again. They were sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. One was at the head and the other at the feet. Woman, why are you weeping, they asked. Because they have taken my Lord away, she said, and I do not know where they have put, them, put him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not recognize that it was Jesus. Woman, why are you weeping, Jesus asked. Now, I'm going to fill in some things here in my, my version of the story. So we've got Mary, an insignificant woman at that time. I'm not saying that women are insignificant, don't, so don't quote me on that. An insignificant woman at the time who wouldn't have been credible for her testimony, so she needed the men for her testimony. But she's the one that first came and... and experienced what she saw with her eyes but didn't understand it. And then two angels came along to comfort her because she was crying because her hope was gone. She thought someone had come and stole the body of Jesus. And they asked her why she was crying and, and uh, they bring her some comfort but it's not enough comfort. And then she sees Jesus with her own eyes but she doesn't realize who she sees. Okay? Woman, why are you weeping? And then Jesus asked, Whom are you seeking? What is this passion that you have? Why are you so heartbroken? What drives you to see Jesus face to face? To see my Master, my Lord, my Savior, my friend, my God. This is what's driving her. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him off, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. He called her by name. First one that Jesus speaks to by name is this woman, Mary, because her heart burned. Now I'm thinking back in Scripture and thinking about how she worshipped at the feet of Jesus, how she poured out her heart and her money on Jesus wiped his feet with her tears because she was so happy just to be in the presence of Jesus. And I think back to where Mary and Martha are serving and Jesus says, I'm not going to take this from her because she's worshiping. And now she can worship because she knows that Jesus is alive, that her hope is not gone. And he's going to send her back to tell the disciples and then he's going to preach more for 40 days. And then he's going to send her back with the disciples to pray for the promise that's coming in 10 more days so that she can be the church, even in her insignificant role as a woman in that day. But yet it's so significant in God's plan. Thinking was, she was, he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him off, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. Then it says she turned. Do you, have you noticed that? Wait a minute. Verse 14 said she turned around and saw Jesus. Then she turned again. Did she do this? <laughs> or does it mean she turned spiritually? She was spiritually awakened. She saw Jesus with her physical eyes, but now she saw Jesus spiritually. She recognized who he was. She turned and said to him, Rabboni. Now there's so much that word means, but it means Master, Lord, Prince, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who I have pledged to give my life to that he, because he is the Christ, the Messiah. And he is here to teach me how to live a holy life to, for God. And then on top of that, Jesus has expounded upon that, that the reason that we're to live holy, which was already there in the Old Testament, was to be that witness so that others would know God in His glory. And now we have the ministry of the church. That she's the first one to take part of it. 
She says, Rabboni, which means teacher. He says back to her, do not cling to me. Not because he hasn't gone to the Father yet. Don't cling to me physically. Because with Jesus here, I just want to hold on to him. But he's here living inside of you, and he empowers you to go do his will, to be his hands and feet. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. When he ascends to the Father, you'll have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And you can cling to me spiritually because you will know him. You will dwell with him because you believe in me. Instead, but go and tell my brothers. The first call to, for Mary to go. I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. I am going to ascend. The Holy Spirit will come. Right now it's time for you to go tell your brothers and sisters that I am still alive. And I'll be teaching you for 40 more days and then I'm going to ascend and you'll have power that comes from on high. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what, she had, what He had said to her. It was the first day of the week and that very evening while the disciples were to, gathered together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Now I'm thinking of all these Bible verses about the fear of the Lord only and the fact that your fear causes you to do or not do what you choose to do. So you need to fear God and you don't need to worry about what you eat or drink or anything else. But they were in locked doors together, not separately, for fear of the Jews. So Jesus came to them and stood among them. Peace be with you. Peace that surpasses all understanding. Peace that you cannot know unless you know that you're not condemned of your sins. That you have the power of God living inside of you. That you are a child of God. That your sins have been paid for by Jesus' blood. His sacrifice was acceptable to God. All of these factors. Peace be with you, he said to them. After he had said this, he showed them with, with his, their eyes, his hands and his feet, or hands in his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. Why did he say it a second time? You've seen with your eyes. Now let me hear your spiritual blindness so that you can see spiritually, so that you can have true peace. As my Father has sent me, so I am also sending you. And you can't go without the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 22, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Wait a minute, I thought that was at Pentecost. Oh, at Pentecost was the power that the Holy Spirit came to all believers and has remained on all believers. You cannot see the kingdom of heaven as Jesus told Nicodemus until you are born of water and born of the Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Verse 24, now or but, it's an, it's an article or, or uh, conjunction. Thomas, which means twin, and you'll find him mentioned in John 11, John chapter 14, and in John chapter 20. In John chapter 11, you kind of you remember this, and you've got to read God's Word and study it to do this. Basically, Jesus is on His way to Jerusalem. And Thomas says, if we go with Jesus, we're going to die. Well, let's just go and die then. That's the way I take that He said it. Kind of sarcastically. He meant it, but He didn't mean it because He didn't fully spiritually understand. He didn't fully believe. He saw the mighty miracles. He saw with His eyes, and you're going to see this here, but it still hadn't penetrated yet. In John chapter 14, that's when Jesus says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I'm going away, and I'm going to come back for you. And Thomas says, um, We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? I've I got to see this. I've got to touch this. I don't understand this spiritually. And then we see him here in John chapter 20 where he says, I'm not going to believe unless I can touch him myself. He's got head knowledge but the Spirit hadn't convicted him and changed his heart yet. Hasn't baptized him, hasn't filled him, however you want to say it. So Thomas, called Didymus, which means not twin, it can be used for twin, but it means twofold. 
Oh, now that puts a little more explanation on it. Here we've got a man that says, I believe in God, that walks right with Him and everything, but he's not born of the Spirit yet. Two-sided, he will reach that point, just like we hope Nicodemus with, did, where he has been spiritually healed and he sees Jesus for who he is and he's been born of the Spirit. You can use it as twin, but it means two-sided. He's one of the twelve and he was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Now the scripture implies that however many there were all together because of fear of the Jews. I don't know why Thomas wasn't there and I'm not going to put any thought process on that because we don't know and it, yeah, I can make all kind of assumptions from that. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, Here's what's important. Unless I see the nail marks, unless I can see this with my own hands. But see, it's spiritual. Blessed are those who believe for the fact they did not see, which is you and I, which it goes on to say. Unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my fingers where the nails have been and put my hand into his sides, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were once again inside with the doors locked, we assume for the same reason, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you again. Then Jesus said to Thomas, he calls him by name, just like he called Mary by name. Go ahead, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Now, I have to ask you this here, just as I ask myself. If I truly believe that God lives inside of me, that the power of the Holy Spirit is in me, sealing me, sanctifying me through and through, conforming me to a life that I will not sin, that sin becomes foreign to me, I won't want to have anything to do with it, where I, I can even love others and even love my enemies. If I believe that, am I living it or am I got, still got doubt and fears in my mind? And then when I get to that point, do I believe the power that I have that if I just have mustard seed faith, I can say to the mountain, jump into the sea, and it will do so if it's God's will. That, that's Scripture. Do I believe this or do I doubt? Stop doubting and believe. Thomas replied, my Lord and my God. We get somewhat this climax of, of what happened that week from the resurrection to this point where Thomas said, Ah, oh, I get it. You're exactly who you say you are. You are my Lord, the one I pledge my allegiance to. You are my God, the creator and sustainer of all things, my redeemer. And because of Jesus Christ, my friend. Wow. Wow. So how am I going to live my life as a result? Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Then Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe. Now what does it say that, it did, that Jesus did? Jesus performed many other signs. And yet he said that I'm going away so that the Spirit will come and it will be for your benefit so you will continue to do the things that I have done and even greater things you will do. Wow. But these are written so that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Spiritual blindness taken away from two followers because we've entered into Jesus not being here anymore on this world, but the Holy Spirit being here with us, so that we can fix our eyes on Jesus by faith. We can follow after all the patterns of the Old Testament saints, uh, heroes and heroines, so that we can throw off everything that hinders us from running a race that lives our life to the glory of God and hopefully saving others along the way. You'll get some of this same account from Luke 24. So I'm going to go there now, and I'm going to start in verse 13. That same day, two of them, all right, two disciples, and we go from the woman who's there by Jesus' side worshiping to some disciples, key disciples, John and Peter. They're all key, but I throw that in for emphasis. 
to doubting Thomas, I throw that in there for, for emphasis, to two other guys, okay? That same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and uh, deliberated, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. They were spiritually blind. He asked them, What are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stood with sadness on their faces. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these recent days? What things, Jesus asked. The events involving Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. This man was a prophet, powerful in speech and action before God and all the people. Our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping he was the one, the one who would redeem Israel as a kingdom. And besides all this, it is the third day since these things took place. Furthermore, some of our women, we can't believe their testimony, astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, but they did not find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision from angels who said that Jesus was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found out it was just as the woman had described. <laughs> Those companions were Peter and John. We, we should believe them. But him they did not see. Then Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones, how slow your hearts are to believe. You've got the mind process going on, but you don't have the heart process. To believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for Christ to suffer these things and then enter his glory? So then I have to think, what things am I suffering for Christ? Oh, that doesn't mean I've got to go to some foreign land and give up everything I have. It just means that I need to take time to fill my pump and take advantage of where I'm at in this uh, witnessing place. That's not what I'm looking for again. In this ministry, where I'm at, in my mission field, there's where I want to go. Sorry. Because God may not be calling you to go to some foreign country, but He's at least calling you to go to your neighbor. <coughs> to your family, to your co-workers, to the person that you meet at the grocery store so that they can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And when they want to ridicule for the good life that you live, they know that they can't condemn you. So instead they ask you, what is the hope that you have? Are you witnessing for Jesus? We were hoping He was the one that would redeem Israel. But... Jesus was talking about another kingdom. And beginning, verse 27, with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was written in all the scriptures about himself, which he did, continued to do. As they approached the village where they were headed, he se seemed to be going further. But they pleaded with him, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. If only they realized that when he left, that he would abide with them forever in the power of the Spirit. He would stay with them. He wouldn't orphan them. He wouldn't leave them. Okay? So he went in to stay with them. While he was reclining at the table with them, he took bread, spoke a blessing, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized Jesus, and he disappeared from their sight. You know, it would be so easy to walk by just sight only, to know that Jesus is over there, and I've got to go over there to be with him. But instead, we're called to walk by faith. And Jesus is here with us, taking every step with us, empowering us to do our mission. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us as He spoke with us on the road and opened the Scriptures to us? How much time are you spending on God's Word as bread for your soul compared to the time you fill your stomach with bread for your physical Verse 33, And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them, the women and the others, they were gathered together, except Thomas. You've got to read the other scripture here to know that he's not there. And saying, The Lord has indeed risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the road and how they recognized Jesus in the breaking of the bread. 
They were describing these events when Jesus himself stood among them physically again. Peace be with you, he said. But they were startled and frightened, thinking they had seen a spirit. <laughs> Come on, spiritual. We fight a spiritual battle, guys. You don't have to see everything to understand that. And there are angels among us, and God's will will not be thwarted. Not one hair on your head will be harmed outside of His will. But He does call you to give up your life for Him. Why are you troubled, Jesus asked, and why do doubts arise in your heart? Look at my hands and look at my feet. It is myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While they were still in disbelief because of their joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. Jesus said to them, These are the words I have spoke to you while I am still with you. Because there's going to be a time when I'm leaving, but your mission is the same. And you're not going to be locked up for fear of the Jews. You're going to go out in mighty power, and you're not going to worry about your own lives. You're going to worry more about telling the gospel to others, because if they die without hearing it, then they face eternal damnation for their soul. <clears throat> These are the words I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he told them, what, and he told them this is what is written. He first told them about himself. Then he said this, The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and in his name... Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed to all nations. Now, if Jesus is gone, how is Jesus going to be the one proclaiming it? Oh, yeah, God's Word is out there. He doesn't have to have you. He can have a spiritual encounter where angels come or whatever else it is. But He's called you and I to be His hands and feet. There's many ways that He can bring salvation to men. But He's called you and I individually and collectively to bring the gospel message to others. He's given us authority and the power to do that. Verse 48, You are my witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but will remain in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. You're baptized and then you put on your new garments, dressed in white out there to go proclaim the message of the sacrificial lamb that laid down his life for you. And that's why you give up your life to serve King Jesus, the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Verse 50, when, they had fin when Jesus had led them out as far as Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. We get the blessing on top of that. While he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, praising God continually in the temple. Now they have gone out of, from locked doors and they've gone to praising God in the temple. But yet they still haven't been clothed with power from on high. They still have to wait so they can pray to receive this glorious gift called God Himself, the Holy Spirit, living inside of you. Is He living through you? The power to do even greater works. John 14, I've talked about this a little bit, but now I'm going to read it. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't worry about what you're going to be clothed with, what you're going to, to eat, who's going to kill you in the name of Jesus, that you don't have the gift that you need to do it. You just don't know how. You just not no, no. Be His witness. Don't let your hearts trouble, be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me as well. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. Just as the angels told them, just as Jesus told them. And I will welcome you into my presence for all eternity. So that you also may be where I am. You know the, 
the way to the place where I am going. Lord, he called him Lord, said Thomas, we don't know where you're going. Can you see all that awakening that got Thomas to go out and give up his life for his king? We don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you know him and have seen him because you see Jesus physically. But when the Spirit comes on, you will see him spiritually. Now we get another person involved. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough. He's thinking physical again. Jesus replied, Philip, I have been with you all this time and you still don't know me. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own. Instead, it is the Father dwelling in me. The Father dwelling in Jesus through the Spirit that came upon him and he was immediately taken out in the wilderness to be tested. Instead, is the Father dwelling in me, and because He's dwelling in me, He's performing His works. Does the Spirit dwell in you, and are you performing His works? It is for your benefit that Jesus left, so that the Comforter, the Paraclete, the one called to your side to bring you aid in so many ways, are you letting the Spirit do this? Verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the account of works themselves. Now he's back to the physical again. At least believe because of the physical, because eventually, hopefully, you'll get to the spiritual. Just like Thomas. Truly, truly, or verily, verily, you can trust me on this, I tell you. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I am doing. Are you doing the works that Jesus is doing? He will, even, he will do even greater things than these because the reason that you'll do this, you'll do the works that Jesus did and even greater works you'll do is because the power of the Holy Spirit will come and dwell with you because Jesus is going to His Father where He's preparing a place for you where He will come back for you and claim you. So the thing is, is are you dressed? Are you dressed like Jesus, walking like Jesus, talking like Jesus, proclaiming God's will as somebody who is redeemed, purchased back from a different life, a life that would lead to destruction? Instead, you're living a life that shows the light of Jesus. Why would you hide that? Why would you not turn on that power? Jesus left and gave you power from on high so that you could live it. Now, I don't know what you got from that, and I hope you go study more, but here's my question. Are you plugged into that power, and is the church in this country plugged into that power? Because if we are, then we are doing the works that Jesus did, and even greater works we will do. So I'm going to close there with a prayer for us to realize the power that the Holy Spirit gives us. Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you that Jesus was obedient even to death on a cross, that he followed the Spirit, that he sought your will to perform the works that you had set out before him. Even with anguish, he cried out for, to you to take this cup from him, this cup of suffering, if it were your, your will. But not his will, but your will be done. Oh God, I am so thankful that Jesus suffered and died for me. And that he did go away because he didn't orphan me. Instead, he sealed me with the Holy Spirit and empowered me with the Holy Spirit to live a holy life and to tell others. Help me not to fear Help me not to be worried, but to instead be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that is my prayer for each and every one here in this church building today. This is also my prayer for all believers, that we will be of one accord, of one mind, 
because we are empowered by one Spirit. We serve one Savior, one God and Creator of all things. Thy will be done, Thy kingdom come. Father in heaven, we do thank You and praise You in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.